History has a way of challenging us, judging us, compelling us. In the autumn of 1955, a newly appointed Alabama federal judge joined a hard-working seamstress and the minister of a small congregation on a path destined to change the arc of history. Judge Frank M. Johnson's historic civil rights decisions not only led to ostracism, cross burnings, and death threats, but helped to change the face of the segregationist South and defiantly forge a new way forward. In his courtroom, he called for social justice, civil rights, and human decency. During this turbulent era, the bravery of Rosa Parks, the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King, and the decisions of Judge Frank M. Johnson challenged Americans to decide what kind of people they wanted to be. From that point forward, equality and civility have become paramount to our American experience. Without one, we cannot experience the other. Today, surveying the international landscape, it is immediately apparent the need for a non-political presentation of the historic and ongoing struggle for judicial, civil, and human rights is more necessary than ever. The Frank M. Johnson Jr. Civil and Human Rights Institute will stand as a beacon for human dignity, mutual respect, and equal justice under the law, designed to build bridges from the past for a more enlightened future. A place for learning and illumination, placed in the fulcrum of the original civil rights movement in Montgomery, Alabama. The Johnson Institute will continue the efforts of the civil rights pioneers to change the world. Change that will solidify the undeniable fact that justice and equality go hand in hand. Now we're going to see uh, part of the story of the triumph of the law. Judge Myron H. Thompson, the son of Tuskegee, is the first African-American judge of the Middle District of Alabama. Appointed by President Carter to succeed Judge Johnson in 1980, you'll remember that President Carter appointed Judge Johnson to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in 1979. Judge Thompson has served our court and nation for over 38 years. He is a renowned jurist, a wonderful colleague, and a great friend, both professionally and personally. Join me in recognizing Judge Myron Thompson to moderate the first portion of today's program. On September 13, pardon me, September 15, 1963, a bomb exploded at the 16th Avenue Baptist Church. Four little girls were killed. Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Morris Wesley, Denise McNair, and Carol Robertson. Later this afternoon, you'll hear a play about these girls. But before that play, we'd like to present to you a story about the dogged effort led by one person to seek justice their dogged effort to find out who committed this horrendous crime and the dogged effort to bring one of the perpetrators to trial. Joining me here this afternoon is Ed Carnes, who was then Assistant Attorney General of the State of Alabama. Ed. Also joining me is George Beck, who was then Deputy Attorney General now of Alabama. <laughs> George, 
George was the second man in charge. He really ran the office. <laughs> and finally, joining me here this afternoon is Bill Baxley, the Attorney General, that is former Attorney General. Bill. I do have a cell phone here because I'm keeping time to make sure that we cover a lot of territory. But I, I want to say that we've really divided this, this afternoon into four parts. The first part is to give you sort of a background of the events leading up to the bombing in 1963. The second part is to give you a story about the decision that was made to reopen uh, the investigation of the bombing, and I emphasize reopen, and pursue a new investigation. The third part is to discuss the trial itself. And finally, the fourth part is to discuss the verdict and the events to follow. So my first question is really for Bill. Why don't you give us a little history about what it was like back in 1963? George, uh, thank you. Uh, 1963 was probably the most momentous year in the entire civil rights struggle. And Alabama was the center of that. In January of 63, Governor Wallace was inaugurated and made the uh, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever speech in his, as his inaugural. Uh, later that spring over in Mississippi, Medgar Evers was assassinated uh, going into his house. In June of that year, Governor Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door to bar court ordered admission of uh, two black students, and that's uh, Governor Wallace and Nick Katzenbach, the Deputy Attorney General, who was uh, Kennedy's Attorney General, sent down on the scene. Later that summer, quite a few things happened. We had uh, several bombings in Birmingham. Uh, the uh, houses of, uh, well, you had the August uh, uh, March on Washington with the Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, as you see pictures there. But in Birmingham, you had uh, quite a few bombings that occurred right around that time because a court order had finally played out. It had been pending for several years and it finally uh, came down to be final that uh, some uh, very few handful of black students were gonna be admitted to the uh, formerly all white Birmingham school system. The picture you just saw was, but that was, uh, two of the little children, little Armstrong children. You had also uh, Fred Shellsworth that was leading the parade for them. And the uh, lawyer, one of the lawyers, Oscar Adams, who was at the trailing there with the hat on, and he was the first uh, uh, African-American that would be elected to, the, uh, appointed to, and then elected to the Alabama Supreme Court. Uh, but that's what the children saw at every school. That's at Phillips High School. And that's what they were met with when the little children were sent uh, to the schools. Uh, but later in August, after that ruling came down, it really escalated in Birmingham. And uh, that's Arthur Shores, who was one of the lawyers also in the cases. His house was bombed twice, once in August, and then again in, in September, about a week before the bomb went off at the, at the church. And there also was a bomb went off uh, in August, I believe it was, or no, in June, at uh, A.D. King, who was Martin Luther King's brother, who was a pastor in Birmingham. A bomb. That's his house where the bomb went off. Uh, but then in September, uh, well, earlier, and it was culminating in September, uh, you had the demonstrations that uh, became known as the Children's Crusades. And this is important. They, uh, the center of the demonstration was the 16th Street Baptist Church. And the minister allowed that to be used where the uh, young people, the, the, uh, that would primarily the demonstrators, 
would come in and be schooled on being nonviolent, be taught about how they had to endure whatever taunts came their way and whatever. And they would go to plan was to march out of the uh, church and march just several blocks to City Hall and uh, make, make their demands. But they never did get to City Hall because when they marched out of the church, they were met with fire hoses, uh, police dogs, and uh, the might, all the might of the Birmingham uh, uh, establishment, uh, law enforcement establishment. And it was because the police commissioner was Bull Connor. And Bull was one of the uh, most, uh, I suppose, vicious racists we, we had in Alabama on the scene. And Bull had been defeated uh, for, gov for mayor, but he refused to vacate his office. And uh, that's, that tank there is a water tank that Bull had especially made, and he rode around in that tank and it had a water cannon on it. And it's now in the Civil Rights Museum in, in Birmingham. But the children uh, would march out of that church and were, were met with the fire, uh, the fire hoses you saw and the police dogs, and uh, they were, uh, you can see these pictures went all around the world. And it, it was uh, enough to where uh, some business leaders in Birmingham happened to be in Tokyo when these pictures were splattered all over the front pages of the uh, uh, newspapers in Tokyo. And they said, something's got to be done if uh, Birmingham is going to be dead if we don't do something. So the business leaders came back and they effected a settlement of the grievances that the uh, uh, marchers were marching for. It's a very modest settlement. It didn't uh, do anything much for integration, but it did say the downtown stores. Most of them agreed to hire, uh, each one would hire one uh, black salesperson. And uh, so the kids really uh, won a, a victory for, uh, without even getting down to City Hall. <coughs> But about 3,000 of them were arrested and carried in school buses. They overflowed the jails and they had to build a stockade out of the fairgrounds, state fairgrounds, to keep them in. But uh, after the children were arrested, uh, when the, the kids uh, started going to school, then it really exploded after the bombs went off in the minister's houses. And on the 15th of September, as uh, Judge Thompson mentioned, bomb went off at the headquarters of the marchers, the uh, 16th Street uh, Baptist Church. No, wasn't, wasn't the uh, city actually known as Bombingham? Uh, was the city actually known as Bombingham? The Bombingham? Right. Uh, <laughs> That's the way it was always talked about with me. It was, uh, there was so many, 40-something <laughs> bombs went off, and uh, they, they, it got the, nick, the name, nickname, or, or infamous nickname of Bombingham instead of Birmingham. And it turns out that Chambliss was responsible for the vast majority of uh, those 40-something uh, uh, bombs that went off over a course of almost 20 years. Now, we do have pictures of the actual uh, church destruction after the bomb. You want to sort of show that, Bill? I, sure. think, I think you can actually see uh, places where, I think it's called like the, the crate, crater where the bomb went off. Well, if you noticed, there, there was a... And then we want to look at the picture in the church. Yes. Uh, the church, that's the most famous picture. That uh, was a very beautiful uh, stained glass painting of, of Christ, the Good Shepherd. And the only damage it really did to that uh, was to blow his face out, almost like he couldn't stand to see. Uh, even the image of him couldn't see what had gone on. But if you show those pictures of the, uh, the damage to the church and see, the, the blast uh, was a huge blast. Uh, and it was placed under the stairs at the back of the church. And it just happened that the uh, top of the, the stair, that was right, those stairs were right by the ladies' restroom. And the little girls were in, uh, in between Sunday school and church. They were in the restroom. There were five of them in there. And if you sit, notice that, uh, those uh, cars were blown back uh, almost five feet away from the curb. They'd been parked with the tires up on the curb and they were blown back about five feet. You can see the damage to the buildings across the street there. Now, Bill, I want you also to talk about where were you when this happened? <clears throat> I was uh, getting ready to uh, start my senior year in law school at the University of Alabama. 
and I vividly, vividly remember it. It had been, like we said, a momentous year, but this was the was by far the worst of anything that happened when it came out there were little girls killed in church and it affected me visibly and, and I couldn't eat and, uh, keep going on the pictures if you would do we, can I sit sit come on and sit down <laughs> <laughs> you'll see uh, that is uh, the uh, the little girl uh, Denise the 11 year old was standing at the uh, wash basin there and, and one of the other little girls was tying her sash, retying her sash. That's where she was standing when the bomb went off. You know, I remember the uh, incident as well. And to me it was, you know, I, I think as a child you always think there are two safe places, your home and your church. And I grew up in the church. and. Uh, and I guess every child thinks that if he goes, he or she goes home, you're safe. And if you go to church, and a lot of civil rights people went to the churches for safety. They would gather at the churches for safety. And uh, uh, for a small child between hearing about these four little girls and hearing about Emmett Till, your sense of safety that people would come after you if you were black and even if you were a child and harm you. It was an incredibly traumatic time, I think, for not only for the state, but just I think for any child who was able, a black, particularly a black child, who was able to understand what was going on. The minister's sermon this day it was publicized was the subject was the love that forgives. <laughs> Ironic. But Bill, in his closing argument, told the jury he didn't want to pay a whole lot of attention to that. He was more interested in Old Testament. <laughs> it was a beautiful thing to hear. And, uh, and he told them that Chambliss had not one tinge of sympathy. Well, um, I want and you not to show him any evil. And this, I wanted to tell us now about your election as Attorney General. You were elected in 1970 at the age of 28 as Attorney General of Alabama. When had you decided to pursue the perpetrators of this bomb? Well, when the bomb went off, as I said, it affected me, and uh, I made a vow to myself that I wanted to try to do something. Now, you gotta understand, what I envisioned at that time being able to do was maybe I thought and hoped that maybe the FBI, the Justice Department, would make an arrest, and I was going to go volunteer to write brief, talk briefcases, bring cokes, hot dogs, cigarettes to the investigators or the lawyers. And do, that's what I envisioned being able to do uh, if something were done. And of course, nothing was done. And, and, and in 1968, uh, the feds closed the case file. Uh, Never had one that really was serious uh, at the local or state level. It was J. Edgar Hoover that ordered the file sealed. We later came to suspect it was because the FBI had a number of wiretaps that were less than perfectly kosher in the case. I, uh, I, I was only a freshman in law school when the bombing occurred, and you know, it was a real serious thing. You there to study the law, study about justice, and and there's something like that happens just what, 60 miles away, I guess, in Birmingham or in Tuscaloosa. But uh, it seemed like after that, after uh, there were a couple more bombings, and then after that, it kind of died down and quit. And the talk about it did. The, uh, there didn't seem to be, especially when the FBI closed its file, any effort on city, state, or federal level to seek justice and to investigate the case. And, uh, in fact, why don't you tell them what the theory of the state of Alabama was as to who the perpetrators of this act, what the theory was? Well, the state, uh, of course, the first thing was that the blacks themselves bombed their own churches to get sympathy. Uh, that was a big, a big thing. Uh, we started investigating, we quickly dismissed that. We knew you had the opportunity, the means, and the motive to do that. And 
and we worked it up from there. But the bill was elected at that age, uh, 28. Uh, he asked me to be the deputy, and he told me that priority was going to be this case. And I, I said, great. And I was enthused about it, but I didn't have the passion that Bill had about it. Because we had other things we were doing on corruption and, and uh, government theft and insurance companies. Uh, so we, we, were, we were doing a lot of different things, but Bill kept coming back to that. And uh, three or four years into that first term, I got a peek at the file. And when I saw the charred remains of those four girls on those corner slabs, uh, I knew that I, I had to get passionate about it because you can see the death there, but you can hear, you can hear the liveliness because just minutes before they were killed, they were giggling. They were having a good time. They were looking forward to Youth Sunday. They were talking about going to a movie after the church. And then bam. And so you have to go home and hug your daughters and, and know that Something's got to be done. So from that time forward, I, I rededicated myself to help the bill anyway, anyway you want. Bill, you actually decided, though, to pursue this case before you were elected. Well, when I was running, I knew that if I won, and I hoped I would win, that uh, that was going to be a priority for me. Now, I didn't tell anybody, because if I told anybody, I never would have got elected. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, the day before I got sworn in. They gave us a badge and a commission and keys to the office. Why don't you show them what you're talking about? I think that's uh, it right that, there. Yeah, this was before the days of the uh, 800 bar. <laughs> so they gave us that little card to the office holders and maybe the, the higher ranking officials. And that card had a number of the largest cities in the, in the state. And it had a local number for Birmingham and Huntsville and Anniston and whatever, Mobile. And so you could dial that local number and it would ring at the state switchboard here in Montgomery. And so then you'd say, the little lady would come on, you'd say, how about uh, ringing my office or ringing the governor's office? Or uh, you, if you were in Birmingham, you could call and say, I need you to ring a number in Mobile for me. So they'd hook you into Mobile. So I knew that I would be uh, using that card quite a bit. And so I wrote down the day before I took the oath I wrote down on that card because I knew I'd be using it. Uh, turn it's, to the back, if you would. It's, it's uh, the next card over, right? Yeah, that, this That's is the it. back of that first card. So I wrote down the numbers one, two, three, four, and I put the name of the little girl, the four little girls. If you see, that's my handwriting. Uh, the one on the top got worn off because I used the card so much. See, I had it in my bill folks. but I wanted to be reminded of every day that I was in Elton, every time I used that card, that I wanted to do something about those little girls if we didn't do anything else. And so I, I used that card uh, every week while I was in office, and it was a constant reminder we needed to keep going, keep going, keep going. So when did you actually decide to pursue this case after you were elected? Oh, within a couple of weeks. We sent over, I first sent over and got the uh, files from the State troopers, and then we went to Birmingham and got the Birmingham got a copy of the Birmingham file and a copy of the uh, Jefferson County Sheriff's file, and uh, started working on those. But they weren't much help because they didn't. But I think you also said most of them showed that they thought the blacks had yeah, done this most, to themselves. Most of the manpower was spent on trying to prove this theory that George mentioned that uh, the blacks had set the bomb themselves to quote get sympathy. Oh. Which, uh, it's hard to imagine now that anybody would seriously think that. When it came time to strike the jury, that informed uh, Bill's decision that he didn't want any white folks over 40 years of age on the jury. And uh, of course, the defense didn't want any black folks over, under, or around the age of 40. <laughs> so they used all their strikes, and this was way before Batson. It was a decade or before Batson. They used all their strikes to strike blacks off, and Bill was striking all the older white folks. So the jury, according to one newspaper account, I don't remember at the time. Of course, I 
27, everybody looked like they were Iron Chef Hooters in their 40s. <laughs> uh, and the newspaper report said the largest representation was housewife, white housewives in their 40s. Now, who was your team? Well, the trial team was uh, George and John Young and myself. Uh, the, the person who's going to handle the appeal, if there was one, was uh, Judge Carnes, Ed Carnes. Uh, the investigation was headed up by uh, Jack Shouse, former detective, uh, chief of detectives in Montgomery, who had solved the uh, bombing in Montgomery of Dr. King's house back in the, uh, the 50s. And uh, I knew that Jack had solved that, had even gotten confessions from the Klan and the all male, all white juries turned them loose. But uh, I decided then I wanted to get to know Shouse and became friends with him. And then I hired him when I got elected attorney general. Uh, by then we'd been friends, but the reason I decided I wanted to be friends with him was what he did on solving that case of Dr. King's bombing in Montgomery. Uh, then we also had John East. I think Tom Ward was an investigator, a retired Montgomery officer. Uh, we had other guys that floated in and out of the investigation, George Royer. Uh, and we had, uh, and then I turned it in when we, later I don't wanna jump ahead, but uh, when we got access to some of the information the FBI had, then I decided I wanted a new set of eyes looking at it and I brought Bob Eddy in. Well, why don't you tell us about how the FBI got involved? Okay. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I want to hear George's view on this and your view, because they're not the same view. Uh, our first tip was that the people that had, had done the bombing was uh, a group out of uh, the Atlanta area, uh, J.B. Stoner and his group. Uh, his assistant was Dr. Fields. So we chased Stoner for the better part of a year. and. Turned out he didn't do it. He did it. He and his group did a lot of bombings around, and they bombed temples. They bombed Jewish temples in uh, Charlotte, Nashville, Miami, Jacksonville, Atlanta. Set a bomb at Temple Bethel in Birmingham, but it didn't go off, thank goodness. But it wasn't a total waste, even though Stoner and his group, they were as bad as, as they came. Uh, even though they didn't do that bombing at 16th Street, we did find out that they had set off a bomb earlier in the 50s at Reverend Shellsworth's church, who was the leader, of, of a very brave man, leader in, in the Birmingham area. Uh, and so we, we indicted Stoner and later convicted him of uh, bombing Reverend Shellsworth's church. We, we couldn't, the statute of limitations had run on the church bombing, so we, everybody thinks we convicted him of that. But we really didn't because the statute of limitations ran because nobody was injured, thank goodness. But under the Alabama statute, and then this is something that George and Ed and other young guys did, they're creative. They found that the statute in Alabama did not have a limitations on it. If a bomb caused injury, death, or was uh, an explosive was set off in or dangerously near to an inhabited dwelling. So these guys went back, and, and even though we, it was the church that was bombed, we didn't charge him with that because the statute of limitations was wrong. They, they charged him. Uh, they went back and found out who lived in the houses on either side of that church, which was, was about a, a less than a yard away from either side, and they found out who was occupying it in 1957 when the bomb went off. And so we convicted him of, of setting off explosives dangerously near to such and such a residence occupied by so and so. That's what we convicted him of. An interesting sideline on that is that uh, even the police force in that time, Will Connor was under a little pressure to arrest somebody because the bill said they had, uh, by this time, 40 something bombs going off. So they had heard about Stoner and the Confederate underground. And so they arranged to uh, buy him to come over, pay him $5,000 to come over and bomb Shelter of Church. And he agreed to do it. They set it up through undercover detectives and he was going, they were going to agree to do it on Thursday night. So Stoner got wise to him, came over and bombed it on Wednesday night. And uh, of course there were no witnesses, no trap to spring. So uh, Connor had egg on his face and they just filed that away. Later we got those documents and got the exact testimony and statement of Stoner and were able to 
put that case together, which he was later convicted of. Let's go back to when you got the FBI records. Okay, well, there's one other little thing that's kind of interesting. After we realized Stoner didn't do it, we next got off on another kind of wild goose chase, and we heard that the Montgomery clan had done it. And I should have had enough common sense to know the Birmingham clan was mean enough they didn't need any help from the Montgomery clan. But we ended up, although our information was wrong, and they didn't do that bombing and didn't help, we did solve a case where the Montgomery clan had killed a young man that was his only crime was being black and being hired by Wynn Dixon to drive one of their trucks. And this crime, they killed him out here off of a bridge over the river, made him jump off, and it never did go as a murder. But we solved that. We weren't able to bring him to trial, but we uh, did solve the case. Then we started zeroing in, which is what you asked. Yes. Them. We finally realized that the people that it did, that it looked like the, uh, had done it, were the, the Chandler's group, of the, uh, a clan group in, in, Montgomery, in Birmingham. And after we got into that, we realized that the FBI had focused on them, on the Chandler's group, from the beginning, within minutes, practically, of the bomb going off. They knew who did it. Or according, knew who, according to you, actually, you said, if I'm repeating you correctly, the FBI knew who had committed the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing within a few days after it happened. With a, less than a few, less than one. Less than one. The FBI yeah. knew this. But we knew then that we needed to get uh, help from the FBI and at least coordinate with them. Because our people that we were uncovering by then were saying, well, we told this to the FBI back uh, when it happened, blah, blah, blah. So I was kind of naive and I thought that uh, I had a good record of working with the FBI when I was DA in Dothan and as Attorney General. So. I sent in through channels, would they cooperate with us? Because uh, I knew the federal statute had run, so it wasn't interfering with, with an active prosecution. And I didn't hear from them. And time went by, and time went by, and time went by. I knew they were going to check me out as being a deep south guy you shouldn't be just be sharing your information with. <coughs> but uh, we didn't hear, and, and the weeks turned to months, and the months turned to years. And by then, several years had passed, and I still hadn't heard. And so I was in Washington one time, and I can't remember exactly the date, except I remember Gerald Ford was president, and a man named Levi was the attorney general. And so uh, I had a good friend up there named Jack Nelson. That's the man whose picture was that's, up there. Yeah, that's Jack Nelson. And Jack's from Alabama, Richmond, in Talladega. But Jack, was one of the most famous newsmen, he's passed away now, that we've ever had in, in the United States. He was, for nearly 30 years, the Washington bureau chief of the Los Angeles Times. And so I would see him most of the time when I'd go to Washington. And this one night I was up there, and usually we'd go out to eat or I'd go to his house. And so he said, you still working on that bombing case? I said, yeah, but I think we've reached a dead end because we, we, we think we know who did it. But the FBI has got a lot of information on them. They know who did it, and, and I thought they'd cooperate, and I explained the whole thing to them. And Jack said, uh, well, if you want me to, I think I might can help you. So he said, I, I've got uh, some pretty good clout over the FBI, and I think I might can help you if you want me to try. I said, yeah, absolutely, please do. So later we went on, I went on back to the hotel, and he went home. And early the next morning, he called me. He said, actually, you had your coffee yet? I said, yeah, I had two cups. <laughs> and he said, well, all right, you sure you still want me to uh, try to get the FBI on that case, will you? I said, yeah, absolutely. We gone if we don't. He said, all right, I just wanted to make sure you felt the same way after you had your coffee that you did when you had four or five beers. <laughs> I said, yeah, we got it. So he said, all right. So I turned out later what he did. When he went uh, over there and told the uh, attorney general, that uh, he said, my bosses at Times have authorized us to run a front page story for a week across the top of a headline. It's going to say the FBI and the Justice Department are preventing the lawful authorities in, in Alabama from prosecuting the Ku Klux Klansmen that murdered the four little girls. So we're going to bring little girls' uh, relatives up here, take their pictures in front of the FBI. We're going to bring the prosecutors up here, take their pictures in front of the Justice Department, 
We're going to run it for a full week. Then they're going to syndicate it. We're going to submit it for a few lists. I said, give us, a little, give us a little time. Give us a little time. So Jack called me and told me, said, uh, I think you'll be hearing something. And sure enough, for a, a reasonable time, I got a call from the special agent in charge of the FBI in Birmingham. And he, he acted like it was just something that was been on his desk for a week or two. He said, Mr. Baxter, that uh, request you've got for, uh, on working with your office with the bombing case, and we, we want, uh, we're going to okay that. He said, uh, what you're going to have to do, we can't let our files out. And you're going to have to uh, send somebody, who, whoever you want to, up here. We'll make them a space uh, in our office, and we'll cooperate with you, cooperate with them. And so that's when I got a fresh set of eyes on it. That's when I called Bob Eddy, who hadn't been working on the case. Well, Bob Eddy had been the sheriff up in, in Huntsville. In Huntsville. Huntsville. Yeah. Bob, great investigator, so all of them were. And I said, Bob, you haven't been working on this, so you don't have any preconceived notions. I want you to start from the beginning, find out everything there is about our, in our file, in our case, and then you move to Birmingham, get you a hotel room or an apartment, stay to pay for it, and you stay there till you uh, finish this case. And he went down to the FBI office, and that's when I learned that the FBI's no, I didn't learn it then. 25 years later, I learned that uh, the FBI's definition of cooperation is about daylight and dark from mine. If Bob knew enough to ask for something, they would bring him what they had. He couldn't copy it, and he, but he could make notes. But if he didn't know to ask, they wouldn't tell him they had it. And so it turned out later when, uh, uh, in the, Doug Jones was prosecuting too, but I don't want to jump ahead of ourselves. It turned out they had information in their files that they didn't tell us about. And we didn't know to ask for it, that we could have convicted at least one more uh, when we convicted Chambers. But that's getting ahead of us. I, I, want, I want to ask George about the FBI. Now, you said there was a memo <coughs> that the FBI sent around well, asking their agents to investigate, but. That's right. It's called Do the Memo. It was published, I think, in about 63, 64. And it was directed to all their field agents, the special agents in charge, just saying that you can uh, cooperate locally up to a point, you can investigate, but you're not to get heavily involved and not to try to bring the case, uh, you know, in the, in the federal system or, or state. I, I got off a little bit, Bill and I did, on between the FBI, because I knew the FBI had a lot of informants. In fact, that's 1965, we learned after the fact that when they'd have a plan meeting and 20 people show up, half of them were in informants paid by the FBI. I know when Ms. Luizzo was killed, you know, the FBI had to burn one of their informants at that time. So I always had the feeling that the FBI had received information, new information, and was holding back information uh, because uh, they didn't want to look bad because they did not. Uh, but what wasn't there? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to say now, when, when I criticize the FBI and, and George too, uh, we are not critical of the FBI agents that did the work. They they were simple. they were absolutely were wonderful. It's the decision makers at the FBI level, high level. To put, that, level. to put that in perspective, when they finally unsealed the record to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Birmingham. They shared them with the state in 1995. There were 9,000 pages. But Bob was so frustrated, and that's what got us along because he didn't know he had to hold his mouth right, like Bill said, to get the information. And uh, even then, they would keep uh, some people's names confidential. They would have a, a stage name or a pseudonym or something, and he wouldn't know who that was. And a lot of times, they wouldn't tell. You. Well, let's 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 move on to the actual investigation that followed after you got this information from the FBI, the witnesses, the people you started talking to. George, why don't you tell us about her? Well, of course, one that became very important was Ms. Blinn, and uh, Jack Shouse had gone up to Detroit. She had been visiting on the night of the bombing, and she had gone by and actually seen and identified Mr. Chambers. She did it to the FBI within days. That's why they knew uh, she, within days. She told the FBI he was out on the street in a car with a dome light on at 2 a.m. in the morning in the black section of Birmingham in an alley behind the church. 
2 a.m. And obviously, she thought it was suspicious that two white men would be in a black neighborhood. Four white men. Four, four white men. Thank you, Bill. Good to see the two of them. Four women. That's right. Bill Chandless was on the passenger side. She was driving that way. The dome lot was on. So she picked Chandless out of the photo lineup that had a lot of folks in it with the FBI within two months of the crime. So she, the said, FBI, she said that week that Chandler, she, she dead level recognized him, picked his picture out of a big bunch of pictures, and also gave a to the T description of Blanton's car that they were riding in. And is, that, is this her? Yes. That's Ms. Glenn. Okay, why don't you tell us about going to Detroit? Okay. So I sent Jack Shiles up there and, and a couple of investigators uh, to Detroit. And they, they, they found her in Detroit. And it took a while to find her. Uh, and so uh, they went up there, interviewed her, came back. Jack came to see me and said, well, found Ms. Glenn, talked to her, said, I got good news and bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? I said, well, tell me the good news. He said, Ms. Glenn is a very smart person. She's a very nice lady. She's very believable. She's obviously telling the truth. She can put it on Chandler's, absolutely. Uh, she knows Blanton's car. And, and she's, she's the kind of person that the jury is going to love. I said, well, what in the world can be bad? And he said, well, she says she's not ever going to come back to Alabama again. <laughs> back then, you couldn't make a witness from out of state come to state court. Now. Every state has a, what they call a reciprocal witness act. You can't, but you couldn't back then. And I said, well, you need to go up there and tell her so and so and so and so and so and so and so. He said, we told her all that. I said, no, you go back and, and I wrote down on a legal pad. You go back and tell her, tell her this. He said, we told her. I said, well, go tell her just like I got it written down. So they went back, came back and said, she won't come. I said, all right, let's try another plan. Well, by then, we'd already, would. Judge Thompson being the first who had hired quite a few African Americans as assistant AGs. And we had one guy, Milton Belcher, who lives in Montgomery, that uh, I thought was no offense, Judge, but the most I personal. There. You know, you so you, you'd go in. by then. <laughs> Mil Milton, I thought, was the most personable of, of the black assistants that we had. He was very outgoing. He was president of the student body at his high school in Elba, which was 99% uh, white. I mean, very outgoing, friendly guy. So I took Milton up there, and Milton she couldn't go. So I said, I gotta go myself. So I went myself. I said, I have to do everything that gets done here. So I started. <laughs> <laughs> and she had put out all these goodies for us. And then Jack said she'd done it from the beginning, every time. And, and tea and cookies and cakes and homemade stuff. And so I started telling her every way I could how, why she needed to come back. She said, Mr. Baxter, you seem like a nice man. All these people you've sent up here are nice people, but I just hate that you've wasted your time. So I've told them that I am not coming back to Alabama, and I am not going back under any circumstances. She said, I wouldn't even fly over Alabama in an airplane. I wouldn't even <laughs> breathe a, a breath of air. In fact, if, if I was deceased, I wouldn't allow my remains to be buried. <laughs> And so I went over there. I, I was torn between being angry at her and being frustrated and being sad. I went over there to that little tray that she would put out, and I noticed she had a Jet magazine. And I picked it up, and it fell open to a page. It was a, a, the whole issue was about the Montgomery bus boycott. And the page it fell open to had a picture of Rosa Parks and her attorney, Fred Gray. And on the other side had a picture of Dr. King and, and Fred Gray. And so I picked that up and went back over there and I said, uh, I said, see, see this picture of this man right here? That is the lawyer, the man that Dr. King trusted the beginning of the civil rights movement to. When it was born, he trusted this man, Fred Gray, and, and Fred Gray delivered for him in the U.S. Supreme Court. And I said, if the man that Dr. King trusted at the birth of the Civil Rights Movement would come up here and tell you that uh, you need to go back to Alabama, would you? She said, well, 
I'd certainly consider it. I said, oh, we out of here. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I said, go with the first payphone. Back then, we had payphones. That was another block. So I stopped at a payphone, called Fred, and got him, told him what uh, the story. He said he'd drop everything, come up there. So we stayed in Detroit, sent the state plane back to pick Fred up. He camped the next morning. Went over there, we went to see her early. She put the goodies out for us again. But before she let Fred talk, she got up. She wasn't no, I mean, she, she wasn't a, 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 one of those wallflowers. She got up and got that magazine. And thank goodness Fred didn't age much. And she held it up right there in his face. And she looked at him, looked at the picture, looked at him, looked at the picture. And she finally said, it is you. So then she let Fred talk. She, Fred, thank goodness, uh, uh, did a, something we couldn't do. And Fred convinced her that she needed to come back. She agreed to come back. She was one of the two best witnesses we had. Why don't we move on to the, the trial itself? Uh, obviously, we had uh, one of the reasons we, we have to keep this moving because we don't have it so much time. We had four little girls. And I, I want to talk about the little girls themselves because sometimes we get caught up in the, uh, the prosecution of, of the people who perpetrated this famous act, but we forget that we are talking about four little girls. And the first one was Addie Mae Collins, and uh, uh, she was considered rather shy, and, but people who talked to her and talked to her friends said she was this incredible softball player. She also had a sister, didn't she, Ed? She did, uh, Sarah. Sarah. And Sarah was in the church at the same time. Why don't you tell us she about that? She was in the same room. Sister? Yes, that was Addie. That was their twelve-year-old sister. Addie yeah. was fourteen. Right? Denise was the youngest. Was eleven. The other three girls who were killed were each fourteen. In fact, they were born in the same month of the same year. And then Sarah was twelve, uh, and she was in there and was helping one of the other girls, and was facing the mirror when the explosion happened she had very serious damage. She's sometimes referred to as the fifth victim, even though she survived. Uh, they took over 20 pieces of glass out of her. There's a picture taken of her in the hospital with bandages over both eyes, and they thought she was going to be blind. She eventually regained sight in one eye and uh, uh, was the one person in that room who survived and is still alive. Uh, I think when they found her, she she was just calling out Addie, Addie, Addie. Uh, the other one is uh, Cynthia Lawrence Wesley, who is here. Uh, she was considered by her teacher to be an incredibly brilliant student. She was a saxophonist, uh, taking dance lessons, and actually uh, uh, had lived with her biological parents who were known as the, Mor as the Morrises. The Wesleys had taken her in so that she could go to a better uh, school. And uh, uh, she would go home to her biological parents every, every Sunday. Uh, the next one is uh, Denise Mc uh, McNair. Now, Denise, this is rather interesting, which I had uncovered. Denise wrote a short story called The Boy Who Wanted a Pet. Uh, and the story, and can you imagine, this is from an 11-year-old girl, it was about black and white kids playing together. So even at the age of 11, she recognized the world as it existed and the world as she wanted it to be. And so her story was about a world in which these black and white kids played together. And I also find very touching is that she holds this doll. And I've been curious about the doll. Now, obviously, it's a white doll. Uh, that's probably another story. But this doll, according to our court librarian, was called the Chatty Cathy doll, which was very, I see some people nodding heads out there. I never heard of it. Uh, very popular doll back then. And it was the first talking doll to pull the strings on. Is that right? Yes. OK. Oh, you know, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, first, I first keep hearing doll. the story of my wife. If only she'd kept it in the box, it would be worth $10,000. Right. And finally, uh, we have uh, Carol Robertson. 
And I, you know, when I was going through the, the record here, which was a thousand pages, the appellate record of this case, it was really difficult, first of all, to look at these girls. I mean, just just to look at them was hard because you, every time you looked at them, you thought about what had happened to them. And I always found her dress rather interesting. I thought maybe she was going to church, but someone tells me she was probably going to maybe a wedding, maybe a, a part in a wedding. But then as I got to know her about her more, I realized that we had so much in common. For instance, uh, uh, she liked Cole Porter. Her favorite song was in the still of the night. And, uh, uh, but the really interesting thing I learned about her was that people said that she and her sisters, she and her sister, Diane, and their friends would go to movie theaters. You know, back then, if you were black, you sat in, in the balcony. And they dropped popcorn on the people below. <laughs> and I remember it, it just drew back this memory, this very deep memory I had that when I was a kid, my mom and I would send my brother and I to Nashville to visit my aunt, who had kids, two boys, approximately our age as well. And the big thing was to go to the movie theater. And of course, when we went to the movie theater, we had to sit in the balcony. And uh, my aunt said that one of us, her youngest son, could not go because he had been put out of the theater twice for dropping popcorn on white people below. Is that where that popcorn came from? Yeah. <laughs> so when we went to, once finally we convinced my aunt to let us go to the movie theater and, we, and to let him go as well, and we get in the theater, he promised us, just religiously promised us, you know, I will not drop popcorn. I will not do this. Of course, you, when you're not only sat in the movie theater, you sat in the front of the movie theater when we were little kids. And uh, sure enough, you know, 15 minutes into the film, the usher goes like this. And my cousin Michael had dropped popcorn right on the white people below. And uh, so I, when, I, when I see this picture, I, I, I just love it because I, I realize that Carol you know, shared this common memory of dropping popcorn on white people in the dark. <laughs> and I, it, 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 she, she, just, she just stole my heart, I have to admit it. Uh, I have a feeling that she never would have suffered for the status quo. She, she said, you know, I, I just, I just uh, know that uh, things have to change. And I also, uh, it, makes, it draws to, to mind that as a child, you know, there are certain things that the punishment is worth it. <laughs> and one of them is dropping popcorn over <laughs> a balcony in a dark movie theater. But anyway, Bill, I want to get back to you because you said you chose McNair to proceed with. So why? Well, several reasons. She was uh, an only child at the time. Right. And she was the youngest. And also, uh, her dad at that time had been elected to the legislature and was well thought of and, and known in the white community as well. And so I felt like it might, uh, we'd gotten four different indictments. George could tell more about that. George handled the grand jury. I didn't go to the grand jury. But we uh, uh, had to pick one of the four to try first. And I uh, thought that possibly the combination of Denise being the youngest and being an only child, and, uh, and then some of them, people, even the white jurors might be familiar with their dad. And he was well thought of uh, in, at the time. And uh, so that's why I happened to pick her. But if I could digress just a minute, the, uh, when you mentioned Carol Robertson and what might have been, and she has a, a cousin that became a lawyer and is, is a lawyer in Birmingham right now, one of the big major uh, defense firms, uh, business firms in Birmingham. and. Cynthia Wesley, Wesley uh, after her death, the family that was uh, keeping her missed her so much, they went out and took in another little kid. And that kid that came in, not, not to replace her, but uh, in, a, in a way, came in uh, following her footsteps with the Wesley family. And she became a PhD, she passed away about a year ago, and went to Texas and, and was a very successful uh, educator and highly successful and well thought of and uh, so that tells you what uh, uh, you know you can't replace the losses of what these children might have been might have done but again so tell us about why why Denise as well, for the old reason Bill said I mean, we 
we also realize that if we tried all four at one time and didn't get a conviction, then, uh, you know, the case may be over. And also, if we try one, get a conviction, don't get a conviction, then more evidence might break where we can add other clansmen in the next round of uh, criminal indictment. And Judge Carr says the law made us do that. Yeah, why don't you yeah. tell us about the law? I was in charge of making sure that if they got a conviction, it would be not be a reversal. I always thought it would have been easier if I'd been on the other <laughs> side and swap places with them, particularly when I heard of Baxter's closing argument at trial. But the law in Alabama then, there were some decisions that clearly held that if a single act killed more than one person, you couldn't prosecute it separately. Most often, vehicles, drunk drivers, wipe people out for dead. You can't prosecute them four times. It's one act. The law professor example of that particular rule, which was a minority rule in the states at the time, you shoot a rifle and it goes through two people, the bullet does and kills both of them, you've got one crime. Now that, fortunately, we used to fuss about it in the AG's office, but fortunately, by 2000, that had changed. The Alabama Supreme Court had abandoned that rule. And as a result, Blanton, who was prosecuted in 2001. Now, Blanton being? Oh, I'm sorry. Thomas Blanton, who was another one of, of, of Chamless's gang. They had a small, violent, the Klan wasn't violent enough for them, so they had a small, violent group called the Cahaba River Bridge Boys, or Cahaba Bridge Boys for short. And they would meet outside the Klan meetings to plan the really violent stuff away from the informants. And Thomas Blanton was one of them. He was in on the, he was in the car. That was his car that night. He was in on the bombing. So was Cherry. So was another guy named Cash, who uh, got divine uh, capital punishment inflicted on him before he could be tried. A fire truck fell on him, as I recall. But in any event, Blanton and Cherry were tried in 2001, 2002, after the 9,000 pages was released, were released by the FBI. And by then, the Alabama Supreme Court had changed that rule, so they were able to try four indictments, a murder of each child. You didn't have to pick one and go. And what was the theory that was used? It wasn't really murder. No, they were not, they were not charged. With our case murder. was absolutely, we had a little bit of a fuss about this, but our case, we could not charge regular at that time, first degree premeditated murder. We had to charge first degree universal malice. Premeditated malice of forethought, they called it, was you intended to kill one person and you kill them without legal justification, excuse, etc. That one specific person, or two or three specific persons. Universal malice, on the other hand, was greatly disregarding uh, human life with universal malice, uh, created an act, or committed an act that was uh, greatly in dangerous of human life without a design to kill any particular person. That fit our facts perfectly. That's sort of like what? Like Shooting a bullet into a cr shooting a gun into a crowd, yeah, not or aiming at anybody in particular, but you know you're going to kill. Or somebody. driving a car into a crowd, right. or setting off an explosion, uh, and that fit our crime perfectly because one of the most incriminating things that we had about Chandler's that they found and used was Elizabeth Cobb, his niece, who despised him, testified to some incriminating statements he made. The most incriminating one was kind of good news, bad news for the prosecution. It was the Friday after the bomb went off and killed the girls. He was watching TV and Reverend Cobb, she was a minister then, said that the guy on the TV broadcaster said that that may be murder charges if when they find the perpetrators. And he's talking to the television with her in the room and he said it wasn't supposed to kill anybody. It didn't go off when it was supposed to, which is bad news for first degree premeditated murder meant to kill those children. But it's good, you don't get much better for universal malice. So George Buckle went with that. Why don't you tell us? Same punishment, life imprisonment regardless. Why don't you tell us what the evidence was at trial? 
Well, when you had to try a good case, because some young lawyer that never would amount to his name about the episode on the field and get it affirmed. And of course, Bill is a prosecutor, he's prosecuted hundreds of cases. Uh, I was kind of a novice to prosecute criminal cases, although I had trial experience. And you know, the prosecutor has the burden of proof. Uh, you say it was a bomb, the first thing they object to is no bomb, you have to prove the bomb, this type of thing. So, Bill uh, and John and I, I think, put up a group of people that we thought one going to be the witnesses that we had in an order that we thought would flow in an order that we thought would fit together and would allow the jury to understand the dastard act that this, this guy and others had, had performed. And uh, Reverend Cross, I think, was one of our first witnesses, and he was, of course, the pastor of that church. The bomb had gone off, and he was helping people upstairs. Some of them had fallen and knocked down. The uh, windows had broken. He had to stop and fix a cut on his own little girl's head. And when he made sure everybody was out, he goes outside to see what the damage is. And then all of a sudden, the girls, the girls, people jump. They don't know what he's talking about. He says, the girls, they're in the basement. So he jumps down in that crater, dives through that wart busted wall and starts digging in a pile of debris, left and right, throwing bricks and rocks and digging his hands in and trying to get the debris uncovered so he could see and hope for the best. And then uh, he hears this one voice saying, Addie May, Addie May. And he keeps digging because he can't see. It's smoke, it's, it's soot, it's uh, plaster has fallen down and there's a gentle haze, but he's digging and Others by this time have joined him, and then when he uncovers these four bodies. Now, the, was he uncovering Sarah at that time? No, Sarah was kind of uncovered, but reaching out. She had damaged, she, she lost this, her sight in one eye. She couldn't see out of the others because of the smoke, the blood, and the damage to her eye. And he was continuing to dig as others were, and they're huddled together uh, with the bodies of these girls. Dynamite had sucked out the air out of the lungs and, and cushion had jammed them together and busted the skull and just uh, just battered them all around. They were kind of laying almost in a heap. And Reverend Cross said they were stacked like cornwood. Yep. And that that's kind of the way we started because we wanted to, we wanted the jury right off to see the force of this explosion. We don't know if it's 10, 12, 15, or 20 sticks of dynamite, but we knew it was big. Of course, the assistant fire chief had heard the blast. He recognizes the bomb. He comes over there and he sees the crater. He knows it's caused by a bomb. Uh, the defense was trying to say, oh, it's just some kind of natural gas leak. Nobody said a bomb. And of course, natural gas would run in a lateral line and uh, be bluish looking, probably still be going. But this was, this was a bomb that had uh, dug out a hole and blasted inward through the wall and back, as Bill said, knocked the car back five and six feet. These are heavy vehicles, so it was a tremendous, tremendous blast. And it opened the hole, obliterated the stairs. And uh, he said, it, the crater looked like a bomb had been there. I've heard bomb, I heard that one go off. I've heard 40 something bombs in this neighborhood. I've trained through the military. I've trained uh, through uh, special courses in Florida and Alabama. I know what dynamite does. I know what a bomb is. I smelled it. And later FBI agent McCormick, also, he was still in Birmingham. He came up there. He went through the same training and also testified it had to be a bomb. And he actually got a headache because of that particular whatever chemical is in dynamite. So he's around here. He gives him a headache. He got a headache immediately. And two or three other, uh, I think the marshal, fire marshal, and retired fire marshal came and substantiated them and said about the same thing. And then, of course, they were taken to make civil makeshift morgue in a, a local hospital and the surgeon uh, who examined them uh, testified that clearly the damage and injury to these, these poor girls was caused by trauma which was an explosion, explosive device. Uh, an interesting thing came up because we had the death certificate of each of the poor girls and uh, we were going to introduce them and the defense objected because it had cause of death uh, by dynamite bombing. Well, of course, that's the ultimate issue to be proved, and they didn't want that in there, so 
we wanted the death certificate. We wanted to prove they were dead. Of course, Carter pronounced them dead, testified, and identified the girls, but the judge took out his pocket knife. And each one of those death certificates cut out the word. When it got to kill by or death by, he cut out dynamite bomb. And of course, you know, in closing argument, uh, we all, both of us took a look and said, you can fill in the blank on those death certificates now that you've heard all the evidence you know what went on. So, Why don't you give us an idea, though, of the witnesses uh, who testified that they were certain Chandler's had done this? Well, so, well, obviously, you don't have anyone who was certain. You had, but you had the circumstantial evidence that Chandler was. Elizabeth Cobb. Elizabeth well, first Cobb. of all, we had. Why don't you tell us who Elizabeth Cobb is? Elizabeth well. Cobb. First of all, let me tell you this thing about that. Bill always shows me. He's a, he's the orchestra conductor. We just play the trumpet and second fiddle. <laughs> so he goes up and tells the judge. The judge, uh, uh, this next witness, very important. Says so she's had some death threats. So she's really scared to testify. And, and, and I think y'all just. Clear the courtroom and let's seal it and make sure nobody can come in and scare. I'll tell you, these, these people were still scared 15 years later because one of the she was, she was Chandler's niece. That's right. No, no, I'm, I got another story on that. Uh, <laughs> and, and they were scared. And, and so she sits down to testify. And Art Hayes, the defense lawyer, turns to Chandler and says, Who's that? Who's that? That's his niece. Says, I got no idea. It's his niece. It gives very damaging testimony. And he only tells his own defense lawyer that he knows who she is. She lived in and out of his house for years, went to Klan meetings, knew all about it, and knew what he said. You want to pick up on Cobb's statement? So. Yeah, but let me tell you, I, I had to argue the sufficiency of the evidence on, on appeal. And uh, Elizabeth Cobb was, in my mind, the most important witness because. She was there in the house a lot with the niece, and he ridiculed her and made fun of her and all that for gender identification reasons. And uh, she despised him, but she was there. And one morning they were talking about a press report about a black man who allegedly assault, assaulted a white woman, and she testified that. Chambliss became animated and very angry and said he had been fighting a one-man war to keep the GD N-words down and all this, and if anybody had helped with him, they would, be, they would have won by now and so forth and so on, and if he could find that N-word, he would kill him himself, et cetera. And then he started talking about what he was going to do and said he had enough stuff to flatten half of Birmingham. And she said, well, what good would that do? And he said, quoting from her testimony, you just wait until after Sunday morning and they will beg us to segregate. Just wait. You will see. And that was a day or two before. <laughs> this was Friday, I think. Before Friday the bomb before. went off on Sunday. Right. And then she testified what I described earlier. The next Friday, after the bomb had gone off and killed the four little girls, and then he was talking out to himself. Chan was talking. Chan was talking to himself to the TV and said it didn't go off when it was supposed to. So Miss Cobb not only supplies motive but also supplies direct quote from Chan. It's almost not even circumstantial. It's indicating his intent. On, right. Yeah. By, by the time she testified, she had become a, a Methodist minister. So I think I had her wear a clerical yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It looked like it was new and just been <laughs> <laughs> Any other witnesses that you... Uh, Tell them about Yvonne Young, George. Ms. Young, uh, Yvonne Young, <coughs> that is one of the Klan members that socialized with Chandler. And I think he rode a motorcycle and she jumped on the back of it. And they went over to Chandler's house one night. She was talking to Chandler's wife and she excused herself go down the hall and use the restroom. And she apparently, it was kind of dark and old house, she, don't say she made a right turn instead of a left turn, I'll just say she turned wrong. Uh, and she went into uh, a room instead of the bathroom, it was kind of another dark room, and she looked over there and she saw some things on the floor that she described as giant firecrackers held up a hand like this, just a bundle of them, a bundle wrapped up in a bundle. In, with beige, paper. in uh, beige paper. 
Well, I, I, I don't know about the place, I can't remember that, but I know it was wrapped up in bundles. But then uh, Chambers called her back there and scolded her and said, you have no business in here and get out and run around and all that. And of course, they asked her on the cross for two, two important things there and said, well, you know, that was in 63, and this is 77, hadn't you undergone shock treatments, hadn't you had mental treatment, and so forth, and now you're coming up with this story about this, and of course, on the cross, recall, redirect, we were able to show no, she told the very same story within days after the bombing of the FBI, and that shut that part off. Uh, she, she made a good witness, and then, and then I think Art made a Defense lawyers have to ask questions they don't know the last two. Sometimes you just have to do it. So can't I, want, I want to. Uh, but, the judge is interrupting me. Oh, the blood money. You want to tell about the That's blood money? That's what I was going to say. That's the next thing I was going to say. Yeah, sorry. Was that well, you're just here for the money. There's a reward out there. You're just here for the money. She said, I wouldn't touch that. That's blood money. I don't want any part of it. So she did a good job of correcting and she held up on cross. That's, that's the only kind of witness you can expect. And that makes sense. Well, I, I, job want, on Bill. I want Bill to tell us about after the government had rested, the defense <laughs> put on, was supposed to put on its case. And I call this having evidence fall in your lap. Tell us about that, Bill. Well, they put on some, some witnesses, some character witnesses, and other, other folks, but uh, they, I think their last witness before Chambers, they were intending to call Chambers. And the last witness was his, his nephew, Chambers' nephew, who was a Birmingham policeman. And so I cross-examined him, and I think did the best job I've ever done before or since on cross-examination. I, I ripped him up pretty good. And so he, he, he was walking off the stand after I jumped on him big time. I was walking by, and R. Haynes Sr. and the Haynes were good lawyers, good people, my friends, and I, I respect them. Tough, tough to try a case against, but they are honorable. But uh, Art Sr. stood up and said, we will call our final witness, uh, Mr. Robert Chambers. So Chambers had just been sitting there watching his nephew. And he said, nope, I ain't getting up there. <laughs> I said, uh, what did he say, Judge? He said, no, I ain't getting up there. What did he say, what did he say, Judge? He kept getting loud. And you realize Bill was saying, what did he say, Judge? What did he say? <laughs> so they hear it over and over again. <laughs> he kept saying, nope, I'm not. Because you learn in law school, you can't ever comment on somebody failing to take the stand. That's an automatic mistrial. But I thought that uh, if I just said, what did he say? It wasn't me commenting. He's the one saying that. So, uh, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, now I understand why my job getting it affirmed is the hardest job. <laughs> there was another witness who did a great job on character witnesses. Are you do you are you familiar with this man? Yes. Uh, are you familiar with his reputation in the neighborhood in which he lives or in the area or the city or whatnot? Yes, I am. You know that's based on what you've heard about him. Yes. Is it good or bad? It's good. You know, typical thing. And the standard deal is if you're on the other side, you don't cross-examine, just get them out of there, it's nothing to it, etc. But actually stands up, and I'm thinking, what? You know, and this, this lady is a, an elderly lady, not a hair in her head that wasn't gray or white. Not that there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> just a pitiful little lady, and since she was scared and shaking, and Bill says, now you know that the reputation is what people say about you. Yes, sir. And, and you know that uh, to have a good reputation, you've got to have people say good things about you. Yeah, yes, sir. And he said, uh, well, how long have you been living next to uh, the wife's name and, and Robert Chambers? And she said, 24 years or something like that. And he said, well, now, Tell me what you've ever heard about him that was good. And I'm thinking, oh, God, no. You don't, you don't ask questions you don't know the answer to. And she just didn't say a word. And Bill repeated the question. Very dramatic pause. And then repeated it. She didn't say anything. He said, Judge, I, you know, I hate to be insistent, but could you instruct her to answer the question? And the judge does. Very nice. But said, ma'am, you have to answer the question. 
And she finally says, I can't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to, we're getting a little late in the time now, and I want to talk about one of the real highlights of the trial, and that's Bill's closing argument. Uh, Bill, I know you say you don't remember all of it, but we've uncovered a number of uh, newspaper articles about your closing argument, and we're going to try to reconstruct it, because I think most people who were there would say that it was probably one of the best closing arguments that's ever been given at a trial. Well, why don't you tell us what you said, and this was also another gift that you got during this trial. The best thing was, I was going to give the final part of the argument. George gave the open part and went over the evidence and the law. Then the defense had their part, and then I was going to do the final part. But it broke for lunch right before my argument. So I went and walked around downtown. Still don't know whether I got anything to eat or not. If it was, it was a hot dog. And when I came back, John Young was up there fooling with the exhibits along with one of the investigators. This is one of the lawyers who yeah. helped me. Right? Uh, one of the, the other lawyer, other than George and myself, that was in, on the prosecution side. And so when I came in the courtroom, he said, Baxter, Baxter, come here. I'm going to show you something. I said, no, John, I got to get my thoughts together. He said, come here, come here, I need you to see that. I said, no. He said, you stubborn goat, come up here. <laughs> so I went up there, and he said, look at this. And I, mean, I think it was State Exhibit 1. It was, a, uh, it was the death certificate for Denise. That they cut the thing out of it. So I looked at it and said, okay, okay, it's Denise's death certificate, so what? He said, Baxley, you idiot. Look at the, what, the date of birth, and that day was her birthday. Oh. She would have been 26 years old. I, I didn't even have enough sense to know when I was looking at it. And so that gave me, and that's what just it was a gift that fell in my lap. That let me close my argument <laughs> by saying, uh, uh, and I had spread out on the rail all these pictures of the damage to the church and the damage the, 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 horrible injuries with death and the dead little girls and all this stuff. And at the end, I put the death certificate. And so I picked that up right at the end. I said, when you go back in that jury room, I want you to think about something. I said, this is Denise, look at this exhibit. This is her birthday. It would have been her, I think, 26th birthday. And I said, uh, it ought to be a happy night at Chandler's house, but it won't be. It'd be an empty chair there said it would be, in fact, every Christmas for the last, how I many ever years? 14. 14 years, there's been an empty chair. Every Christmas and Thanksgiving, there's been an empty chair. Tonight, it could have been ice cream and cake, maybe talking about school or a new job or grandchildren even, or a wedding, but there won't be any of that talk at the McNair House tonight. But tonight, you 12 people, We'll have an opportunity to do something that nobody on earth will ever have. And it's something that I believe Denise will know, and I know that she will appreciate it. You will have an opportunity on her 26th birthday to give her probably the best present she ever got. You'll have an opportunity to bring her killer to justice. And some of them start crying. And that's when I really kind of felt like we might have a chance somehow. But that was just something just fell in my lap that I didn't think of. And, uh, it, it, it was a higher power looking out after us. There were a bunch of people crying on that jury, and uh, it had a lasting effect. The jury deliberated four hours that night, uh, afternoon and night, two hours the next morning. Bill, with his superstition about not being there when the verdict comes in, but back in the hotel, Judge Gibson let me sit in his office with the door open, watching the jury come in so I could report to Bill on the moment what had happened, what the verdict was, and he was excited, and I was excited, and kind of shaking to find out what was going on. And he said, what did they say? What did they say? I said, they hadn't said anything, but two of them are crying. They're still crying. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> and it turned out to be very good. It to be very good. I wish we had more time. Uh, to be quite candid with you, you've only heard a bit of the story of this trial, which I consider one of the 
most remarkable trials in the history of the state of Alabama. Uh, you would got one, something else, Bill? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, two things, really. I'll try to make it quick. Art Jr., Art Hayes Jr. told me this. Yeah, this, uh, this is good, yes. His, his dad, after the jury found Chandler's guilty, Art Jr. had to go tell Miss Chandler's. Cause Art she, Jr. is Chandler's lawyer. Yeah, he, right. he, he and Senior and Junior were the lawyers and, and uh, that firm. And so our junior had to go in and tell her, and it was broad daylight, middle of the afternoon, uh, almost noon, or right after noon, I reckon. And he said that the house had the blinds down and the uh, curtains pulled and uh, not a light on. He knocked on the door, and this boy said, Come in. Said he went in, Miss Chambliss was lying in a house coat with a wet rag on, on the couch over her forehead. And the house was dark as it could be. So he said, Miss Chandler said, uh, I'm sorry to come tell you. Dad told me to come tell you the jury has just found, just convicted Robert, found him guilty of first degree murder. And uh, you're going to need to pack him some. He's in jail and he can't get out. You can't, you can't make bond when you're guilty of first degree murder. And uh, so you need to pack his toiletries and some clothes for him and uh, carry him to see him. And she said, Well, when will he be coming home? He said, well, he can't make bond. We've got to appeal. That'll probably take a couple of years. And uh, we're going to give it our best shot, but it doesn't. The judge tried a pretty good case. Probably going to be hard to get this overturned. Uh, he, they, I reckon he knew Carnes was on the other side. <laughs> but, uh, he said, uh, we're going to give it everything we got. But it's going to be hard. She said, well, I mean, when will he be home? When will he get here again? He said, well, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I think at his age, it's very unlikely that he'll he'll ever be out. And she said, you mean he won't ever be in this house again? He said, that's what I'm trying to tell you. We don't think he'll ever get uh, to come in here again. And he said, she sat up and threw that cloth across the room and jumped up, started letting the blinds go, and started saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, praise the Lord, glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah. And they didn't know that uh, they, the, the Chambliss women had been cooperating with us and with the FBI. They even let the FBI put a bug in the cuckoo clock. Because uh, uh, those people were so bad that uh, they, they mistreated. There's one other thing I don't know if you're going to talk about, which is you have one regret about not pursuing the other two defendants. And I want you to end with that. Too. The biggest regret I ever had about being in public office was that I left office without being able to finish the job and, and prosecute the other two that I knew had done. And I, I regretted that because the people that came in after me, by and large, didn't, didn't touch them. So they they did State Attorney General. State Attorney General, yeah. And so uh, it went nearly 20 years, and, and, and I regretted that fairly often. But what I didn't know, if I would have known it then, I would have had to slept a lot better, <coughs> But there was a young kid in law school during that trial in Birmingham, and he cut class every day and sat in the balcony and watched that trial. And 20 some years later, he was the U.S. Attorney, and that's Doug Jones. And Doug Jones came in and opened that case up again. He had to get appointed by Bill Pryor as a special assistant uh, to Alabama Attorney General, even though he was the U.S. Attorney, because he had to be prosecuted in state court. But that kid that watched that trial, Doug Jones, came in and finished what I couldn't finish, and I think that was amazing. And he got two convictions. Yeah. 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 I, want, I want to thank uh, George. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank Ed. I want to thank Bill, most of all, and I'm okay, Bill. Bill, 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 Bill,
Absolutely. <laughs> okay, you, you can use the mic up there if you want to. I got, I got a little senatorial privilege here. <laughs> um, first of all, a lot of folks don't realize this, but Judge Frank Johnson was the U.S. Attorney in Birmingham before he was appointed to the bench. So he was one of my successors. And uh, one of the, the father of one of the girls killed, Denise McNair's father, Chris, one of the great photographers, uh, had some incredible images of the Civil War. <coughs> and Chris took some pictures. He was down here at Judge Myron Thompson's investiture. Right? Was that 80 or 81? 80. 80. And I've, been ha I've had these pictures of Chris. He's older now, not in good health. He's 94. And I've had these for a long time, and I've been meaning to give them to Judge Thompson, but I had cases in front of them, and that wouldn't look too good. <laughs> but I wanted to take this moment. I've got others out here, Judge, but I okay. wanted to take this minute to give you this one photograph thank of you. you being sworn in uh, by Frank thank and you. Judge. Thank you. Let me tell you something, folks. Sitting there watching that trial changes your life. Doing these cases changes your life. And it, I hope that everyone that reads about these cases will get inspired because we have so many things that we need to do right now in this country to bring people back together, to do the kind of things that Bill did, to do the kind of things that their jury did, my jury did. So on behalf of a young kid who went from a law student to U.S. attorney to a United States senator, I'm standing on his shoulders. Before we close, I, I started this evening by reciting the names of the four girls. You know, we, we, we talk about the four girls, but I think it's truly important to remember that they had names. And I want to end this evening by calling out those names again and showing their pictures. Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Morris Wesley, Denise McNair, and Carol Robinson. Good afternoon.